It's not that okay. it is solved. <laughs> okay. So is it working? Fine. Okay. Perfect. Enjoy the stage. Okay, so thank you again. Thank you also for the live streaming. Um, yeah, my name is Jeronimo Castellano. I'm a professor in Dresden. And let's talk about data flow and higher abstractions for uh, programming and programming multi cores, heterogeneous multi cores, and so on. Uh, so, this is a plot that I guess most of you have already seen, and if not, you're going to see it another uh, 10,000 times in your life. <laughs> Uh, but it's a very important plot, and, and people have alluded to this plot before. Is, uh, Moore's law is still there, right? That's, that's, that's the red one. Um, and then you have these inflection points. At some point, uh, mid-2000s, you, you started doing the multi-cores because you had this, this uh, diminishing returns because you couldn't, you couldn't increase the power density. Luca mentioned that, the power density. You cannot dissipate that, that, that density, so you have to go multi-core. And then at some point in 2010, people started talking about uh, dark silicon, and then specialization became mainstream. Specialization meaning uh, having accelerators, things that are dedicated for a task, uh, which is something that we have, been, we have been discussing here. It's not something that is very new. Uh, specialization was new, uh, was, was already there in embedded systems for a long time. Uh, modern designs uh, based on processing, all these kind of things were done with processors and accelerators. But it kind of became more mainstream. So most of our desktops today also have a lot of uh, specialization. And then at some point, and I think that's, it's not drawn here, I, I think uh, at some point there's going to be another inflection point where heterogeneity would also mean that you would have uh, things built with different technologies, not only CMOS, uh, Alberto mentioned MEMS yesterday, but also different technologies for um, acceleration like carbon nanotubes. And there's a lot of uh, work in the, in the devices and technologies um, that is going on that is also going to make our systems even more, even more um, heterogeneous in, 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 in the future. So yeah, things are... So this, this plot is, is, is a great plot to motivate um, uh, the evolution in computing, computer architectures. OK, so yeah, what do we have today? Heterogeneous uh, many cores, scalable platforms, as we saw uh, yesterday, uh, very complex memory hierarchies, domain-specific accelerators, like the TPU that was, that was mentioned already. Um, so I stole this, this image. So this is actually the cover of a book that um, Nikhil Dutt, who was here on, on Monday, uh, published in 99. So this was the SOC in 99. Um, so SOCs today, and uh, so I'm using here kind of a cartoon of a, a TI Keystone platform, which uh, I work a lot with, uh, like six, six years ago, where you have uh, an ARM quad core and a cluster of eight uh, BLW DSPs. Uh, you have some network on chip. They call it network on chip. It's just a glorified bus. Um, and then you have a uh, complex memory subsystem, some DMAs to do communications, and some hardware support for communication, which they call the, the, the queue manager. Uh, so it was a very complex uh, thing to, to work with. Uh, the, the manual had like 800 pages. Um, so yeah, so that's kind of the, the evolution that you see uh, motivated by the plot that was presented before. And so yeah, so the, the, the thing is, uh, so the programmer is kind of uh, uh, desperate at, at how to get things running on these kind of machines, how to get things uh, performant, because they have to understand uh, the difference in performance between the DSP and the ARM. What is the DSP good for? How to, how to send data to the DSP? Uh, the, the ARM is running Linux, the DSP is running uh, a BIOS from TI, which is proprietary. So it's, it's very difficult to program this, this kind of systems uh, for performance. Okay. Yeah, so models, so we've been talking about models, and, and von Neumann is kind of the model that we use uh, for, for programming these machines for, for a long time, for 60 years, because you assume that you are um, fetching instructions in, in sequence and executing them in sequence. And for that, uh, a program like, like C or C++ is a, very, is a very good abstraction, so that's why it, it was with us for a long time. Um, but I think it's needless to say that that's, uh, that's not cutting the job uh, so much. Um, there are different sources of parallelism, SIMD, threads, GPUs, right? And, and, and we know, and we, we, we already know that even for, for SIMD or vectorization, compilers are really lousy. They do a very lousy job in, in extracting parallelism from, from C code. And, and you have fundamentally different resources, like data flow accelerators from Acceler, uh, or tensor processing units from, uh, from Google, or the V100 from, from NVIDIA. So all these kind of things that are, have a fundamentally different uh, computing paradigm. These are not von Neumann machines anymore, so we shouldn't, uh, try, to, we shouldn't try to program them with a, with, a, with a program model that was inspired by uh, a von Neumann model, right? So that's, that's kind of the point here. Um, okay, so I, I said in the abstract of my talk that I was going to talk a little bit about auto-parallelizing compilers. So what is an auto-parallelizing compiler? That, could be, that would be the solution, and people worked a lot in, in this field, right? So this, this kind of, okay, let's, let's skip the sequential code because we have uh, billions and billions of lines of code written in these languages like C, C++, even Fortran, and let's uh, build a compiler that uh, 
produces something parallel, like OpenMP, P3, and so on. And that, that's a topic that I worked on at the beginning of my PhD. And um, it sounds very easy, right? So there's a theorem in a compiler from Alan Kennedy, who are very uh, respected professors in compilers. And they say any reordering of a program that respects all the dependencies is a valid reordering, right? So you can, so it's kind of, it sounds very easy, right? So you just take the program, you check the dependencies, and you can do, uh, you, you, you can move things around, you can execute things in parallel, and as, as long as you don't viol violate those dependencies, then you can, you're fine, right? And that's, uh, that's something that, that many of us pursued, right? Like, okay, let's try to do that, right? Let's try to take a C code and produce pthreads out, or let's produce OpenMP out, or let's produce OpenCL. That's something that, um, that as, as many of you may, may know, uh, end up being more difficult than we thought. Um, so this is a bit of history on, on my side. So this is a paper that we published in 2008 at DAC. And there we were struggling with a, a, a research prototype from the Tokyo Institute of Technology where they had like a, their own, uh, they produced their own um, silicon with uh, dedicated processors, a very fancy kind of hardware support for um, direct processor to processor communication. And um, they had implemented a bunch of, uh, a bunch of um, algorithms in this, in this multi-core. Um, and they achieved, for example, for JPEG in that case, almost 10x uh, on 19, 19, 19 processing elements, and our tools were j really struggling, right? So you, you see that we, we, we get to 5.5x automatically after some iterations of the tools. Uh, and that was not really, really good, right? So we are ha kind of half of the performance that the, uh, that the manual designer achieved. Um, Ten years afterwards, uh, we, we kept working on the tools. Uh, these tools uh, made into a commercial product as well. And, and here you could see that you could, we could support more benchmarks, and we were doing a little bit better compared to, um, uh, to manual programmers or people that were taking, were taking this, were, were taking this algorithms or trying to parallelize them. But in the end, this, this, is, not, this is not going to uh, do the job. Right here, you see the speedups are around four, and that's not kind of what we, what we, what we expect if we have a mini core with 100 processors or something like that. Right? So, so yeah, so this is uh, kind of, there is some progress, and, 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 and there are some interesting technologies or interesting techniques uh, in auto parallelizing compilers, but this is probably not what um, the solution is going to be. So let's talk about the problems, just to, just to understand uh, why, why is it so difficult to parallelize code. So yeah, so the, the first thing in this theorem is that you need to know all the dependencies in order to parallelize code, right? And finding all the dependencies very often is impossible. Sometimes it is possible, but difficult, right? If I give you this piece of code, um, do you think this piece of code can be executed in parallel? So just can we execute in parallel. Is there parallelism in this in this for loop? It's not parallel, but you can do it parallel, right? So, so many of you could, could see that maybe. Um, people that, that work in compilers would very quickly see that there is some uh, what we call loop carry dependencies, right? So you need this in the previous position and this in the previous position to compute these positions, right? This is kind of a stencil, a very simple stencil. This is a real, this is real source code. And, but sorry? The two statements can be parallelized, right? But the, the issue is how much is this a data parallel loop, right? So, like, could you put a, an OpenMP4 pragma on the top, right? So, and um, and so today there are tools that can really analyze these kind of programs. These tools are called polyhedral compilers, and there's a lot of there's been a lot of uh, research in this field. Uh, for those of you that are interested, I think it's, it's worth looking at this. So, in the end, if you if you if you deconstruct every single statement and you put it into this plot, kind of uh, blue is the, the S2. Green is the S1. You could identify there are many kind of independent chains, right? So all these chains of data. So actually, you could you could kind of slice this this loop going diagonally instead of going uh, like this, and you could execute each of these each of these chains in parallel, right? So yeah. So for for programs like this, and these programs are called static affine nested loops or static control paths. Uh, there are different names for the same thing. Uh, these kind of loops can be analyzed by, by uh, polyhedral compilers, and they are, they are doing a pretty good job and, um, in parallelizing these kind of codes. They've been also very um, uh, prominent these days because of the, of the machine learning kind of workloads that have similar structures or stencils or image processing. Uh, if some of you know Halide from Stanford, this is kind of based on the same principle. Try to understand uh, the dependency patterns between instances of data accesses, right? So there's, there's things that we can do. But yeah, in general, 
it is more difficult because we use pointers. We use uh, you, you could have an address that is you can you can just call a function. This function is making a, a HTTP request to get some data. So it's very difficult to track those dependencies. In, in general, it's very difficult. The other problem is exactly as I said: is that you uh, most of the code that we have seen written by in industry is of course uh, use this code in s uh, a style where you have huge structures with pointers so that you have everything is in there and you just update the different pieces of the structure uh, through all your functions and it's very difficult to, to chase this, these things. And something that is probably even more interesting is that often uh, dependencies can be violated, right? So the theorem uh, that I showed you before that you can, as long as you respect the dependencies, nothing happens and you can think, do things in parallel. In reality, many, many, many programs that we write have dependencies just because of the, the way we wrote the program, but these dependencies are not uh, are not really required by the algorithm. And these uh, people from Edinburgh uh, pr present a, a tool that can identify some of these things in in CGO in 2018, which is an important conference in compilers, where you see this piece of code, and, and this piece of code for, for a compiler, for, for a normal compiler, uh, is impossible to be parallelized. But if you understand the patterns, what is happening here is that you are actually uh, for example, visiting a graph, you put the nodes of that graph into a queue, and for each queue, um, you execute a function here, right? For, for, each, for each node in that queue, you call this function. So in principle, this is a very data parallel program. Right? You, could, you just have to have all the nodes and execute f in each one of the nodes. But the way we write this thing, with some bookkeeping with the queue, uh, with uh, this, this while here, uh, marking if this is visited or not. So the way we write this program makes it extremely difficult for the compiler to understand parallelism. So these are kind of the three things. Uh, find dependencies is hard. Uh, coding style in legacy code is, is, is very difficult to understand. And dependencies are sometimes violatable. Uh, and so uh, people have been trying to work around these kind of things. And, and there's been people that have proposed, uh, for example, keywords in C where you could say, oh, this thing is commutative, right? So you can do it in any, any order uh, and, and still you get the same result. OK, good. That was kind of the introduction to, uh, to these things. Uh, yeah, so the bottom line is that for Neumann sequential programming, it's kind of we, we, should, we should be uh, trying to move on. And, and with moving on, I, I mean, for example, use uh, data flow uh, languages or higher level abstractions, and that's what this talk is about. Um, especially in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the domain of CPS, where you have uh, things that are domain specific, you have interconnected systems, so things are uh, interacting with the, with, with the physical world, but also with other devices. So time is important in the way they interact. Um, you have to be reactive because there are things that will happen at sporadic time. You have to react to inputs from the environment. Most of the th these things are real time, so you either need to know this work ca worst case ex execution time. Uh, you need things that are probably more predictable. Hardware is more predictable. I think that's also important. Um, and you have dynamic changing conditions. So many of these things are, make CPS a very challenging uh, field. And um, so I am, from the, I am from the programming side of the world, right? So that's, I, that's how I address these this challenges. But there are many challenges here as well. So, I, so, so predictable hardware, I think, is an interesting, an interesting uh, topic to look at. Um, and how do you architect the systems so that you at least ensure some sort of isolation? And I think having uh, shells around systems, isolation in terms of uh, kind of um, cheap, uh, uh, cheap real state, right? That you can isolate things physically in the, in, in the chip. I think those are uh, good directions, not from the programming language community. Okay, so in this lecture, I'm going to talk about uh, classic data flow modeling, kind of uh, an introduction because this is supposed to be a lecture. So I'm going to give you a little bit of an introduction. What is this? Why, why, what are these data flow models? And why, um, why Cervero, but also many people are so happy about them? What are the properties that we like of, those, of these models? Then I'm going to talk about uh, some of the things that we're doing currently on, on, with these models so to make them more dynamic, adaptable in the context of CPS. And in the end, I'm just going to go a, a, a level higher and talk about domain-specific languages, which I think are an interesting direction. They are very hyped these days. And, and I'm going to uh, discuss why they're hyped and what, what domain-specific languages um, allow us to do. OK, so let's talk about data flow programming. Um, yeah, so data flow programming, you have a graph representation of the application. That's something that you saw yesterday in the tutorial. right? You have this, this graph with, with some connections. Um, there is kind of an implicit repetitive execution of tasks, right? So this thing is going to execute forever. It's kind of um, it's kind of a streaming, right? Things are coming in all the time. Things are produced all the time, and so that's why it's, it's a good model for for kind of streaming applications. It's a good match for signal processing and multimedia because you, you usually people are are used to write these algorithms already with block diagrams. Uh, when we started working on this, we were working with um, 
with wireless communication engineers. They anyway program things in, in MATLAB Simulink at, at the beginning, then they turn all that thing into C code. So uh, why not going through uh, another language before you go to C code so that you can retain some of the logical uh, split of the functionality. Yeah? So the logical split of the functionality into a graph is not always the best one, but at least it's in a starting point that is already parallel. Right? Um, yeah, so the, the why, why data flow? Uh, so it's explicitly parallel, right? So you, you, can, you can see parallelism already. You don't have to go and extract it. And as I said, very often these algorithms are designed uh, in LabVIEW, or in, in, in MATLAB, in, in something like that, right? In SPW back in the days. And, and then, you, uh, then you deconstruct that. You, put, you, you, you give it to somebody that writes it in C. So you lose that, that, that structure. And, and my, my kind of the, the, the theme of this talk is that you don't want to lose those, those structures when you program, right? So here, it is natural to have this structure when you program, where, where you think about these algorithms. You don't want to lose it when you go to C. And something similar happened with domain-specific languages. Right? You talk to a guy that is writing something, um, uh, something in, um, in fluidic simulations, and he's using some mathematical expressions with tensors and so on. Um, and then he has to go and code those tensors and multiplications, uh, from which are very easy to write in a mathematical notation. And he has to go and write them using Fortran. And then you ask the compiler to identify what happened. So that's why uh, it's kind of a theme of this talk. It's like try to, try to retain the logic of what you're trying to program to be able to convey more information to the compiler. OK, so in, in the case of data flow, it's kind of the structure that you have some explicit parallelism. And then depending on the model that you have, um, you get very nice properties, like, for example, determinism. Yeah, that every time you execute this thing, independent of what the scheduler is doing in your system, you will always get the same output. And that's an interesting property if you want to debug, for example, right? So there, uh, and, and so you see um, in different communities, for example, the community of reactive uh, systems, which is which are also like parallel but in the distributed sense. You see today papers about um, like multiverse debugging, right? So people that are using a debugger that allows you to multiverse in the sense that you are following all possible paths because this thing is non-deterministic. And there are some tools that support you in just going all those paths to see what's going on, right? So if you could, um, if you could reduce that from 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 the programming model, then why not, right? So the determinism is, is a thing that you could get from these models, and um, and in general analyzability, you can do scheduling decisions at compile time or runtime that with some more inform uh, or more information um, for doing optimizations and so on. So that that's kind of the the, the overall idea of data flow. And so for this lecture, I thought I will just introduce to you a concrete data flow model so that these properties kind of are, um, are just more, more, more easy to grasp, right? What, what do we mean with this kind of things? What can, we, what, what can the compiler do if you, give them, if, you, if you give the compiler a model that is well defined? So I'm going to give you an example of a model that is very popular. It's SDF. Most of you would probably know them. And uh, the, the, the model that you were using yesterday, I think, was more or less SDF, right? So it is PySDF for, for allowing dynamis, uh, dynamic things, but it's more or less um, SDF. So this is kind of the definition. We don't look at the definition. We look at, at a graph, right? So this is kind of the graph. And so when, when you look at this graph, so you know that this, there are three actors, so like functionality, three computations. So it could be whatever. And there are some channels. So this, 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 these actors can only communicate through these channels. And there you see these annotations and numbers. These are called rates. I don't know if you saw them in, in, the, in the tutorial yesterday. And what it says is that every time I execute this guy, uh, it will consume two tokens from this channel. I'll produce three tokens here and six tokens there. Right? And that's kind of the specification. So um, given this specification, a compiler can kind of uh, symbolically or, or reason about what are possible executions of this network. Right? Like, for example, uh, in this moment, the only guy that can execute is A1. Right? So, uh, it, it consumes these two tokens and produces three here and six there. Uh, at this moment, uh, this guy cannot execute because he needs two data items. This guy can execute because it wants one and two. So actually, this guy can execute three times. And it's executed once, uh, so it consumes one token here, two tokens there, and produces two tokens here. This guy cannot execute yet. So uh, what, what next? So, so A2 will execute again and again. And this is kind of what, what the compiler uh, can do. And we can do further and, and, and do more. Um, more kind of analysis on this network. And um, so these networks can be represented by a matrix. People call it a topology matrix. So what you see in this matrix is that you have, um, you have a column for every actor and a row for every channel. That's depending on how you write it. And, and this is so basically uh, this 3 minus 1 is modeling this channel. Uh, it, this channel A1 produces three tokens, and A2 consumes one token. 
just a representation of of what this network is. Right? So if I if I have if I have a language that allows me to represent to represent this thing, going from the language to the matrix for a compiler is straightforward. Right? We just have it, for example, in the types, in the way the interfaces of the actors are defined, uh, whatever whatever syntax you choose to represent this this graph. So once you have this. Um, this matrix can be used to kind of predict what happens when you execute, when the scheduler decides to execute a given actor, right? So um, if, I, if, I take this if I take this matrix and I multiply by 1, 0, 0, right? Meaning I, ex I execute a actor 1, right? I do this uh, matrix uh, multiplication and I get a 3, 6, 0, 0. And 3, 6, 0, 0 is the state after I have executed a 1, right? Um, so and you can do this further, right? So you, you multiply, you take the state that you that you ended up with, which was three six zero zero, and multiply by zero uh, one zero, which means I will execute a two, and I get the state uh, that I was drawing before. Okay. Now since I since I can do this, I can just ask myself, uh, is there a, a is, is there a combination of vectors, of or executions? that bring me to the initial state, and that's what people call a repetition vector, right? So this is an equation. Um, it boils down just to find uh, the, uh, to solve the system systems of equations for an integer solution. Uh, and the solution to that problem tells the compiler, for example, how to unroll this graph, okay? Which means is if I execute, in this case of this network, if I execute a one once, a two three times, and a three twice, then I'll go back to my original state. And that's cool because if I go back to the original state, I can repeat this, this, this kind of schedule until eternity and run this thing forever, right? Okay, so that's kind of the things that the compiler can do. And the compiler can kind of unroll this graph into this thing, uh, exposing some parallelism here, and compute a, a schedule, a static schedule for this, for this piece of graph. And this static schedule will repeat forever and ever. Is independent of the data that you are yes. 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 Right. So that's just to give you an example. Yes, it's called synchronous, but I think it's a misnomer. Yes. Or a static data flow. Not uh, I actually call them very often static data flow models, and I think you have it as well. You know, we had a long conversation with Edward. Yeah. yeah. Yes. He ag he agrees to that. No. But <laughs> <laughs> I think synchronous is because the abstraction is that uh, there is. Um, uh, the, the, the arrival of input to channels happens like in no time, right? It's like at the same time. Uh, there's no yeah, abstraction for that. Yeah, actually, the data flow there is no notion of is a partial order. It's, it's a partial order, but you, yeah, but it's kind of is akin to the to the synchronous model of digital circuits, right? So where you where you where you assume that everything happens instantaneously, right? So, but yeah, I agree. It should call should be called static because because it admits an uh, static schedule. Yeah, admit a static schedule because the, the 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 rates at which data is produced it doesn't depend on the data as you ask, right? So it's a static mode. Okay. Um, okay, great. So this is this was as I said a, a very quick introduction to data flows. Like I hope some of you probably knew already this thing, so it was not very boring. And it's just to give you an idea of what what a compiler can do if you give the, if you give something that is very restricted, right? This is something that you cannot do if if you give the compiler a pthread application. The compiler cal c would never be able, in general, it will never be able to compute a schedule like this. It will be impossible to really reason about can this thing execute with this schedule forever and ever uh, in bounded memory. It's something that we cannot analyze uh, if we are uh, if we take pthreads application. But that's something that we can analyze if we take this, these models. Okay, and and going further, uh, th this this thing is called HSDF. And, and if you have this HSDF, there is a formula with which you can compute at least a a bound on the throughput that that network can achieve if you know these this row values, which is the worst case execu execution time. And so there is a formula that kind of gives you a bound on if you have cycles in the graph and everything, what could be the maximum throughput that this graph could, could produce, which is also very interesting in the sense in, for real time systems. Okay, so there are many other models. So this is a kind of a HSDF, SDF, CSDF, cyclostatic, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, this is also a plot that is not for me, it's from um, uh, people in Eindhoven, which is a, also a very interesting plot because it shows that there's some trade-off between the expressiveness that you put in the model uh, and the amount of things that you can analyze, right? Um, yes, yeah, so I think that this plot was supposed, so in this plot I think they were selling scenario where SDF, and, and so uh, this would be this, this one here, FSM, SADF. So that's why this is kind of the best one, 
Or it's, this. it's kind of in the middle, right? It's, it gives you like the best of both worlds. Uh, a pinch of salt uh, for this graph, but it's an interesting graph because you have um, different models, and pi as the f would be located around here, right, as well, right? Around uh, pi as the f, I think, is similar to the scenario where uh, the f, uh, but at least here you see a plot where you see what is the expressiveness, which means how m uh, intuitively how many applications can you really write with this model, right? And for the, for the question before, if you have an application where the amount of data that you produce depends on the data that you receive, then you cannot write it with an SDF. You need something different. And that's what expressiveness means. Uh, and then you have how, how efficient it is to implement this. And, and since, for example, for an SDF, you can, uh, SDF is down here, it's not very expressive, but since you can compute many things statically, you don't have runtime overhead, you can, you can just produce a simple C code that executes these actors, it is very efficient, and you can analyze many things, uh, if it is bounded, uh, if, if there is a schedule, many things they can analyze for, for SDFs. Okay, so that's kind of the, the stuff. So in, a, in, in my past, we went for dynamic, um, dynamic models, so we worked with CAM process networks, these are very dynamic. Um, so that forced us, and, and we did this because we, we wanted to keep a very simple programming interface. So we had, we extended the C language and, and also the compiler and everything only with uh, like four or five keywords that were supported by, by the compiler. Um, so the syntax was pretty easy and the hope was that since it was a very simple syntactic extension, the hope was people would program with that. Uh, it really ne never really happened, uh, but anyway, that was the motivation. Um, so there's less, less more information, so we need to do more analysis. And since we were doing a, a lot of analysis anyway for, for partitioning C code and everything, so we could actually look inside these processes to kind of understand the control flow, try to predict which kind of traces may be possible. And in a sense, still, we, 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 retained, we retained determinism. And by analyzing these traces, the compiler can still kind of understand correlations between events, what happens in a part of a network and what happens in the other part of the network, and kind of find, um, um, find not a schedule, not a static schedule, but find a configuration for a dynamic schedule that could be deployed at runtime that could produce good properties in terms of energy efficiency or, or performance. Okay, so, so this is the only plot for Susilexica, that was the company that, that that uh, Francesca mentioned. So that was so these things and the partitioning went into this this company. That's uh, still alive. I don't know how how high it, it is there to follow uh, to fall. Um, so the, the idea is you have this 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 programming model, which as I said is just an extension of C code, uh, fun non-functional specifications in terms of real time and stuff like that. We also work a lot on architecture models, like abstractions of of those platforms, abstraction of DSPs from Texas Instruments and from ARMS, uh, and then fit this into into a, a tool that would do analysis, synthesis, and code generation. Synthesis in the software from the software perspective. We are not synthesizing hardware. Um, some people call this software design automation. So, um, as a, <laughs> as a, as a uh, related to EDA. Um, and then we produce actually C code, right? This is the source of compiler, we produce C code, and so the, the compiler understands the APIs that are down below. So the, it under so here is actually C code that would run on the DSP, so if you, if you could read this, you could, you could see the APIs of, this, of the TI uh, SysBIOS for programming the DSP. And so uh, the purpose here was to improve the, the, the productivity when programming, right? so that you don't have to really care if this thing is going to run on the DSP or it's going to run on the ARM, you don't have to change your code. Right? It is everything decided by the tool, and the tool will select the right APIs, the right synchronization mechanisms, the right uh, FIFO APIs, for example, for communication, and so on. And so that's something that, that we worked um, in the past. I worked a lot on that during my PhD. Good. So that's, we were not alone here. So many other languages exist. Cal, you know, Dol was proposed at the ETH. Uh, Dedalus, uh, Ptolemy, which is a big framework from Edward Lee, to uh, kind of work on different models, computations, and way beyond only, only um, uh, data flow. Um, and those are the information that these models provide, as, as I said, rates or states or action or, or traces. And for architecture models, we need uh, a model of resources, interconnects, memories, and so on, so that we can do, we can reason about this kind of optimization, how to bring this, these applications onto a heterogeneous uh, system on chip, right? That was the, the intention. And for optimization, so this is, uh, as Lucas mentioned before, uh, yesterday, there's a lot of uh, multiple objectives here, right? So the performance, energy, and um, reliability, thermal dissipation, so all these, all this, uh, so this design space exploration that you do for hardware, kind of you have to do for, for software here in a similar way. Okay, so 
just to give you an idea of what kind of uh, what kind of results or how, how, how can you solve these optimization problems. So people have been working on heuristics or genetic algorithms and some years ago we teamed up with uh, Andy Pimentel who's been working on this thing for a long time and, and using genetic algorithms and we just took a bunch of different uh, benchmarks and what you see here is the uh, green is genetic algorithms and blue are different heuristics. Uh, this plot is showing what performance you achieve. So here you basically see that for some applications heuristics are really bad and genetic algorithms are quite good and for some uh, some heuristics like this one over here is really really good in, in, in getting a, a good solution very quickly so um, this is kind of a plot of uh, comparing how, how good do you, do you do with meta heuristics how do you how good do you do with uh, some simpler and faster heuristics and these are simpler and faster uh, as you can see here uh, this is the plot that just compares what is the time that it takes to get to a solution Right, and, and so here, and this is logarithmic, so you see that genetic algorithms, as expected, uh, takes considerably longer time. So this is just to, gi to, give you an, to give you a bit of insight of what kind of things people have been working or what kind of methods people have been using to um, solve this design space exploration kind of problem. Okay, so now, now let me talk a little bit about this um, data flow and, and CPS, so things that, how to make this more adapt, adapt, ad adaptable or predictable and, and um, also be kind of aware that you have other applications the system how can you how can you make this thing still predictable if you don't know which applications will run on that system um, and a bit of reactiveness but I'm not going to go too much into the detail here okay so yeah so, so since since things have, have changed so we don't we're not designing systems to so just run one application so we're running multiple applications uh, but still at least in, in my lab the idea was let's try to retain the things that we know uh, from static mappings Let's try to allow for dynamic things to happen at runtime, but try to retain the properties that we know of these applications at compile time. Right? So that's what people call hybrid DSE. Um, and so more or less the, the idea is that you, at, at compile time you produce a bunch of configurations, Pareto things, as, as, as you saw last time. So you have a bunch of software configurations, right? So using three threads, using 20 threads, um, yeah, so there is the trade off in, in energy, how many resource, how, how much resources you use, um, and how fast are you. So you produce all these this variants at compile time, and then you, at runtime you have some intelligent uh, selecting of variants depending on, on the state of the system. And this is kind of a knock base mini core, and depending on the system load, you kind of have to, and the, and the user requirements, you kind of have to do the best that you can to place that, that application into the system, and if it doesn't fit, uh, then you probably can transform the variant a little bit and I'm going to uh, talk about this, what this transformation means in a second. So that's kind of the, the, the general goal of this, of making these things adaptable, right? So you, you, you keep this information from compile time and at runtime you try to deploy something probably in a different way, but at least that you can expect a similar performance to what you saw or to what the compiler expected, right? Because the compiler produced something because it's, because it's, uh, it's something that will for example, stay below an energy budget or stay below a, a given uh, runtime constraint. Okay, so uh, before I go there, uh, something that also um, enables adaptivity is how, how can you express that uh, some of these processes or some of these things can be broken down into something that is data level parallel or something that is task level, data level parallel. So how can you extend these networks so that um, they are kind of malleable? Malleable is a, is a word that is used in, in in the high performance community. So how can you inc increase malleability so that these networks can also be executed with more or less parallelism if possible. Okay, and this is similar to AdaptNet and parameterized SDS, and this is the, the quote to, to what you were working yesterday with. Okay, so how do we do this more or less? So I'm, I don't have time to go into all the details, but this was something that um, at least I found it very, uh, very interesting area of work. So what we, uh, what we come up with here was that um, we were able to abstract um, the topology of architectures uh, into graphs, of course, we always do that, and also we have the graph topology of the application. And then we thought, can we, given that I have the graph of the architecture and this graph that is gonna be mapped some, somehow, can we define transformations that we can do to this mapping that will respect the properties and in terms of times, energy, and stuff like that. Right, so I'll say that again. So I have a topology of my architecture. It's, it's, an, it's, it's a toroid, it's, it's something, right? This is a topology. And I have the topology of my, of my application, and I have a mapping of how this application should be mapped to this platform. Uh, 
And the question was, can we define transformations so that when, you, when, you, when I put this thing here, if it, doesn't, if, if it doesn't fit, can I move it around? Can I, can I do some changes that preserve the properties? And that's what, uh, that's what we uh, called mapping equivalences or si similarities. And for doing this, we end up um, working with mathematicians. So we said, OK, this, this is a problem that we can solve. And we went to um, mathematicians. And I, I actually, a PhD student of mine is also a mathematician. We, worked with, uh, we, we went to this mathematic lab people that work in algebra. Um, and the good news was that the mathematic, mathematician said, uh, oh, this is an interesting problem, which also meant uh, that that's also bad news, because we had to yes. work very, very hard into really trying to formalize this thing with um, um, inverse semigroups and theories that are uh, not, not my area of comfort, but I enjoy it very, pretty much. In the end, what happens intuitively is that you end up playing kind of a very generalized Tetris game, right? Where you have some rotations, and you can put the application. If this is the, if this is the mapping that we think makes sense, and this is system, so if you play Tetris, you know how to rotate this thing and put it there. And of course, this is more difficult if you have uh, uh, heterogeneous nodes, right? Because this breaks symmetries. Uh, it's also more difficult if you if you if you want to have access to a periphery, uh, to a peripheral, right? Or or, or caches and so on. So, but that's a, that's a, 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 was an interesting project that we did. Also, here I try to mention other people's work. So, um, oh, oh, that, yeah, that this is cool. So actually, we implemented a game. So we put it actually as a game, and we have it for dissemination. So we had uh, like science days in in Dresden, and so we have kids play that game and try to map things. And, and it was funny because kids were, at the beginning, they couldn't do it. So the, the problems get more and more uh, difficult. So it gets harder as they go through levels. Um, but at the end, kids liked it. And, uh, because uh, uh, rotations are, could be very, very weird, right? Rotations is, is not like in Tetris. You, you could do a rotation, and then uh, from a square, you could go to a line and still respect, uh, may respect the, the symmetries, right? Um, yeah, so there's a, there are some related work. Um, I just want to mention this one from um, Jürgen Teich's group in, in Erlangen in Germany. And this is, um, this is a bit more for, uh, restricted for knock based systems. But it's a, also a very interesting approach. If you're interested, go and, and check that out. It's, it's kind of based on constraints at compile time. So the compiler is not anymore producing a given mapping, but it's producing a set of constraints that the mapping has to respect. Right? So then at, at runtime, you have to solve those constraints. You can do it with uh, SAT, or you can do it with some heuristics, and that's how they have proposed to do it. And it's actually interesting because it's a, it's a similar approach. You can find equivalent mappings that way, because then different mappings that respect the same constraint. But it could, in this case, you can also find better mappings, which is probably also good and something that you would like. OK. Um, so this is just a plot to show you some of the rotations that you can do. Um, so this is the result of a heuristic. And this, is, um, and this is a rotation of that result. So it, I just brought those plots here. So it is not very obvious, that rotations. Right? So and especially if you, and, and, and we also encoded symmetries in the application, things that are similar in the application. So then those are even more difficult to understand when you play Tetris, right? Because that's also things that are kind of equivalent from the, from the software point of view. OK, so what we do with this is, as I said, is that uh, this allows the compiler um, to, once it, when a mapping is selected, to kind of uh, move it around to see if it fits in the, in the platform, given that some applications are running already. Yes? Uh, would you prefer oh. questions now? Or, or uh, somebody raised the hand in the back. Yeah, there was a, that, that, that's fine. I mean, same question. If you want, I can ask at the end. <laughs> oh, you can ask now. If, if it takes too long, I will just cut you so that I can reach the end. <laughs> you mentioned SAT. Yes. Um, for this one, we didn't try. Okay. Uh, SAT was the approach from, from Erlang's group, because that's a set of constraints that you want to satisfy. So it's kind of a, a, a perfect match. Uh, yeah, no, I just wanted to know whether, you know whether it works for this application. Or yeah, yeah, it worked. It worked. It took too long. Uh, so that's why the, uh, the follow-up paper, just they use heuristics, and that was quick. No, no, that's what I meant by work. Of course, it works. Yeah. Yeah, so for, for this kind of thing, for these kind of changes, you want to do things that happen within 10 milliseconds or so. Um, so uh, SAT actually works in 10 milliseconds for simple problems. For larger problems, it, it doesn't work. So what we do here, um, it's, it, it works within uh, one, one millisecond, two milliseconds. So that's more or less uh, kind of works. 
OK, so what do we achieve with this kind of thing? So this is a, a configuration where you have an Odroid uh, Big Little. Uh, we have, we're working with a, an audio filter application and a MIMO FDM kind of an application, so a, a baseband processing application. And, uh, and what you see here is that, um, let's see, let's look at this plot. So this is the, for, for only one application, right? So this is audio filter. Uh, so if you let the Linux scheduler schedule this thing, so this is the variation that you get, right? As expected. Um, this is the Linux scheduler with a tweak that we did. So the Linux scheduler kind of at least respect the amount of resources. Then, so then you reduce the amount of uh, variability. And these are just three mappings that we compute somehow with some three heuristics, right? Those are three mappings that we somehow compute. Um, and so you see that the variation is very low. Right? So then that was kind of what we wanted to have. So this is a system that is not real time. So it's, this is Linux. It's an off the shelf. It's just ARM cores. And we, we show that if you, if you, and we modify the Linux scheduler, so the Linux scheduler understands the, the symmetries, and for the big little architectures, those symmetries are really trivial. Um, and so what you see is that you do get some time predictability. So you, you do profit from the, um, what the compiler thought the system would produce, right? Um, and then when you throw multiple applications, you see a similar behavior, right? So this is uh, walk clock time, uh, so this is CFS for four applications, uh, with a little modification of ours, and then the three mappings, right? So the three map, even if you have multiple applications, the, these three mappings remain more or less in the uh, in the predicted uh, place. And then you, you see that again with uh, if you throw there also MIMO of the M. So you see um, for MIMO of the M, the variation for this mapping is better. So here the point is not to compare mappings, but to compare um, the, the the variation that you get. Okay. Good. So. It was, it was a, uh, so we were quite happy with these results. We were more predictable performance because we, we only allow transformations that respect the properties. Um, and it's compatible to what you would achieve with dynamic scheduling. For that, for us, that was already quite good because in theory, at least, dynamic schedulers uh, are a superset of static schedulers, right? So, um, right? so there is more overhead, but you are, we have overhead anyway. And we, and we didn't put a lot of effort in optimizing our runtime, right? Because we are not runtime people. Okay. Let me go quickly through other stuff that, that we've done for, for this kind of thing is robustness, right? So in the, in the CPS things, you, you don't know what's going to happen. Probably some processors are low in temperature. Probably the OS uh, simply decides to do something else. So we're wondering about, uh, okay, can we, if we have all these all this mapping things, uh, then we get a mapping, we get this flexible mapping that we can, can, we, we can, we can kind of turn around. And then the, um, if there is a perturbation in the system, is the mapping still correct? And that's kind of a sensitivity analysis or, or whatnot. And, and for this, uh, I need to accelerate it a bit. And, and for this, what we, we use this kind of design centering methods that are actually used uh, or common in circuit design, right? Where you kind of have to deal with tolerances. And we um, build it into our, into kind of these mapping algorithms. And the idea is that if this is kind of the, uh, the area uh, that you are targeting, right? This is kind of your, your design space. Um, this is clearly the optimum. That's the, the tallest mountain, so to speak. That's the tall, or the yeah, the, or the deepest valley. Uh, so this is the tallest mountain. Uh, the problem with this mountain is that it's very steep. If something changes in any of the parameters x1 or x2, you very quickly uh, go down, roll down, and you go out of the area that is permitted somehow, right? So uh, we work on on these algorithms to to try to also modify the mapping so that we get to these spots where. You, you have more volume around you of feasible solutions. And uh, so this is something that is st still work, in, work on pro in progress. We got some interesting results that I'm going to um, report in a minute. But I think it's, it's, it's an interesting, it's an interesting uh, question as well. Right? So, we, so as a compiler, we cannot really pretend that everything's going to happen exactly as we predict. So it's, it's, it kind of makes sense to think of how can we produce uh, solutions that will cope with these unforeseeables uh, that we cannot predict at compile time. Uh, yes? Did you try to formulate mapping problem as a mathematical programming problem? Where if, if, you, if you did this, if you, if you properly you, if you do this, you got the robust optimization and sensitivity analysis. It's this kind of stuff that uh, yeah. already happens in mathematical problem. Yeah, so the problem is that this is. Um, uh, very discrete problem. So that's that was also a problem that we had with this, like borrowing techniques from from continuous mathematics, like this one, to put it into a discrete setup is, is difficult. Um, that's one one thing. Um, 
postulating this as a as a as a mathematical with a mathematical formulation usually is more like a SAT based kind of formulations. Uh, people have done it uh, many times, or a knapsack problem, right? So there are many formulations uh, or uh, mix LP. In some cases, depends on the models and the information that you have. You can do it, you can, or you can't. Uh, especially if you have traces and so on, it's more difficult to do that because the traces are just just too long. For for SDF or for models that you can very um, concisely analyze time and stuff, it's easier to to have a formal formulation. But it just takes too long, right? So just to solve it with ILP. Yeah, so the, the, the 10 milliseconds is what happens at one time. So that's the dynamic part. Uh, okay, yeah? For the transformation. Uh, if you look at quasi static scheduling. Qua yeah, from uh, Chubra, Batrasharaya, you mean what to this? Uh, Batrasharaya had this, uh, I don't know how yeah, to pronounce this thing. Chubra, but yeah. we also did work on that. Uh, yeah. But all these things are quasi static schedules, right? Quasi static schedule means that you anyway use some synchronization. Uh, so th this, is not, this is not static schedule in the sense of. Um, uh, that you know that's going to happen in this clock, right? You, you anyway use uh, on the communication. You use some well, primitives. It's quasi static because when yeah. you have a data dependent decision, which branch of the problem you have to follow, mm -hmm. and then what you do is that you are actually generating code for all possible paths. Okay. Quasi yeah. static because it is a static schedule. So you do. There is a, 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 an if variable in there, yeah. but the code is loopless and is. Uh, yeah. 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 Static. Okay, quasi static, quasi static in, in that sense. So I remember quasi static schedule is like, because static schedule is that you really know exactly what happens in every clock. Quasi static schedule in that, uh, in, at least in Chura's book, is more like uh, you in any way put some, some barriers so that things do not have to happen exactly clocks. I, and now I understand what you mean, right? So you, you kind of, for subset of behaviors, you compute static schedules. And then at runtime, once you, once you're, you know that you're going to follow that path, Right. You have a you static schedule. Yeah, yeah. So, so it's essentially, it's following all the time at once, right? So the static, yeah, yeah. quasi static schedule, yeah. like uh, part that are not executed. Yeah. So the data don't. Yeah. Work. So in 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 the in the tools we, in the end, so the, the if you, when you write this this program, very often most of the things that you write are simple loops that you know that are static. Yeah, so, so for that kind of thing, in, in a sense, yes, so those, those, those subgraphs, if you wish, can be scheduled static, so they can be computed statically. But in general, for all those traces, the, the, the amount of behaviors is, is very difficult to, uh, so to enumerate. There are applications in which, well, I mean, we can Okay, we can talk offline. But there have been papers where we prove mathematically the properties of quasi-static scheduling. Okay. And yeah. all of that. And uh, the interesting thing is that if you look at the execution time, it's predictable. And it's absolutely you know, uh, the fastest you can dream of, right? Because static yeah. is static fastest is fast. execution, right? So quasi static is if, if you know everything. A static is the is the fastest if 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 you're if you're right, but quasi static yeah. is that you're assuming that everything can happen and yeah, so yeah. It branch out. So the problem yeah. is that and it's called quasi static because there is a limited number of uh, branching yeah, yeah, yeah. because otherwise the code explodes. Yeah, yeah. Because in principle, you could take every branch yes. and explore all paths, and yeah. then generate code for all paths. Yeah. So the memory for the program explodes. Yeah. But in terms of execution, well, this is a fast. Yeah. So, so, so yeah. So I, I, I think, as I said, so for 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 these uh, traces, the the amount of paths will be very difficult to enumerate. So it's going to be very huge. So it's going to be a problem of of of, of size. Um, that a static schedule is, is uh, rocks is, is a, I, I agree, if, if you don't have variation in the times, I mean, if you, if you really have good predictions, right? If no, it's the, it's the opposite. You have prediction, yeah. because every time you make a decision, you are exploring all paths, and you are generating codes for all paths. So it's exactly okay. predictable. Now, the trade-off is that you are predictable the fastest possible, but because of the many branching that you can encounter, mm -hmm. the code can to explode. But yeah. it's not that it's unpredictable. It is predictable because it's static. Yeah. Yeah. But it's static no, no. forcing it yeah. to yeah. become yeah. static. Good. I agree with predictability. I just I was just correcting this, the, the statement that static is always faster. Because so in this case, it in quasi static is faster. No matter what. Even if you do because it you're following all the path. So you cannot do any faster than that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, I 
I'll, I'll give you that. The only thing is, so the, the point is, I, I, I really like static things because I'm a compiler guy. Um, but often, um, if there are many things that are unforeseeable, even if you know the paths, right, but you don't know cache behavior, you don't know many things, um, e so, so there, is, there, is still, there are still some situations in which dynamic schedulers can, can, can be better. That's not the case that we have observed. I mean, it's mathematical yeah. proofs. But the point is, uh, again, I'm not advocating that you should use quasi steps. But should I look at it? But since you are doing the review and yeah. you're saying what is around, yeah. you ought to take a look at what is yeah. uh, Okay, but the, 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 yeah. the, the, the amount of review here is, is a bit little bit. Yeah, yeah, okay, good. Um, okay, let me, let me jump to, the, to what we had obtained. And that's why I say this is work in progress. Uh, um, I think there are more things to do, and what you see here is kind of a, a very it's a, it's a different different experiment to explain. So let me walk you through this. Um, so what you see here are 200 different mappings, so 200 different configurations of this application for an ARM SOC or for a like like big little or for a knock base architecture, right? So 200 mappings that are valid; they respect the deadlines. Um, what we did for each one of the mappings is that we introduce uh, we did multiple experiments uh, introducing perturbations. And then we measure after that whether that mapping after the perturbation still met the constraints. Okay? So like for example, mapping, and these are just sorted. So mapping 200 was valid, but after perturbation only uh, like 35% of the times that mapping was still valid. Right? Mapping 80 uh, like 60% of the times it was valid. And that was the mapping that we started with, okay? Uh, and similar thing here, right? So mapping 100, only 60% of the times was valid. And then we move the mapping, we, we continue exploring the space with this design center and techniques to get a better mapping, hopefully. And that's what we call DC, the DC. So this is the mapping that the design center found. And this is a very happy result, not one that we observe very often. But it was a very happy result because then uh, the mapping that DC found, it was actually very robust to, to perturbation at one time. Okay, that's what you, what you see here. Here, not very good, but so there were better mappings, just randomly, because that's how life is. But at least it was better than the one that we started with. So that's, that's just one, one comment. Okay, also so other things that we are, that we are doing right now um, is to work on representation of mappings, like the mathematical representation of mappings. and. Um, and so what, what this more or less is, is that usually when, when, you do, uh, when you do genetic algorithms or whatever, you, you choose a representation of the mapping that looks like a vector or whatnot. Um, and uh, what we observe is that, the, uh, it's not a very fancy observation, is that depending on what you, how you represent your, your data, uh, the algorithms perform uh, better or worse. So we started working on what is called uh, embeddings, right? So, so how, to, how to embed uh, this data into a different uh, space. Um, and what this plot shows is that actually it, it, it does kind of work. I mean, it's, it's difficult to see it from far away, but uh, this is kind of the uh, TSNE visualization. TSNE is a visualization that you use in machine learning. Uh, so the axes have no, no meaning. It's just kind of a sense of closeness of the points in the space. And what you see here is that uh, if, if you look at this plot, uh, there's a lot of color mixes, right? Things that are very close together, maybe good, green, or maybe very bad, like dark blue. Right, um, so that's what, what you see here. When we use, when we choose a, a, a more interesting embedding, like if we, we, and that's what we were working on, like what are good embeddings for these mapping representations? Then you get a distribution that looks a little bit better, right? So you see uh, the greens are kind of clustered here, uh, the darkers are here, and so which means that this space is probably easier to walk. And that's this is ongoing work. So we are trying to see, well, is this really useful for for robust mapping and for uh, for accelerating the convergence of meta heuristics? Okay, something else that we're working on, this is kind of the link to CPS, I cannot talk too much about this, is that we are looking at um, adaptive AutoSAR, which is a standard put together by the, by the automotive industry. Um, one of the main goals is that this will, should work for autonomous driving. Um, and this is a, a kind of complex software architecture, a service-oriented architecture. Um, they have a test application. Let me go to this application first. It looks like this, where you have, um, and, and we actually have the boards and everything, where you have this video provider, uh, this sends video frames to the, to the processing part, where you have 
uh, video, computer vision, uh, brake assistance. So this kind of kind of understanding the lanes, kind of understanding cars, and the um, and the end solution of this application is to say to the real time system here, uh, or yeah here in the classic outdoors are to say brake or no brake. Okay, this is kind of the application, and we we've been studying this thing because this is this looks very data flowy, like. But it is built into, in, on top of this complex service-oriented architecture. And we kind of realized, without disclosing too much, is that um, this, this, this thing, this software architecture, I, I wouldn't rely so much for autonomous driving. Because if you write code that looks like this, it looks very sequential in nature. But the underlying model is not sequential. Um, you, you do something that looks like 1 plus 2, you expect 3. But you run this, uh, I think we run this like 10,000 times and you get all possible values of 0, 1, 2, and 3. So this is kind of a known issue of determinism in, in multi-threaded kind of things. And what we, are, uh, what we, what we argue here is that it, you, you don't want to have this kind of behavior in an application that, like, that, that looks like this. And we have actually seen that uh, there is non-deterministic and worrisome non-deterministic behavior in this kind of benchmark. And that's something that we're working on with extensions of, of data flow to account for uh, reactiveness and, and, and adding kind of time semantics on top of what uh, data flow offer. OK? Good. So let me quickly go through uh, higher level domain specific abstractions. Uh, because as I say, I think this is an, an interesting domain. And uh, so data flow is a nice abstraction that goes across domains. Many people talk about data flow in different communities. Um, but there are also other abstractions, and uh, in particular, for example, for, for machine learning. Um, and and my, my point here is that I think you, you should match those those domain specific, the domain specific nature of hardware should be matched with some domain specific constructs on the software side. And they don't have to have, they don't have to be standalone languages. They could be kind of embedded in what you, and what you work, and that's what, what we've been working on. Um, and what you, what you see over here is, this is a plot uh, or a chip from, from NVIDIA, I think, or a, a commercial from, from NVIDIA. And what you see here is code uh, written by um, engineers. Uh, that is doing some tensor manipulation, which is common in, in machine learning. We actually started with this with uh, computational fluid dynamics. Um, and then it's even more difficult if you scale this chip down or up, right? If, depending on the product, if this is in a, in a loudspeaker or if this is in the car, you will have different specifications of the similar chip, especially if you use scalable architectures as we saw yesterday, right? So it's difficult to compile this code so that it runs efficiently on these different kinds of architectures. Um, so what we think that you should do is, and, and people are doing this also in other places, is to use uh, more concise languages. So this, this code that you see in the back can be expressed mathematically like this, which is a, and this is an, an interpolation kind of kernel where you have three matrices, and here you use tensor products, and that's kind of doing the same functionality. So and that's what I was saying before. So in data flow, you kind of have the data flow uh, idea of your application in your mind, then you go and write it in C, and you ask the compiler to extract parallelism. Here, the same thing. You have a very concise representation where you, where, where you know about what this operator means, this tensor product. Um, and then you go and write it in C, and you expect the compiler to reconstruct the data dependencies to extract parallelism. So that's, uh, uh, and this is one example of a domain specific language that, that we have developed in our lab. There are some others. and. There are many successful uh, other DSLs in, in the world. I don't know if I have a, have a, if I have a list, but like, for example, Spiral, Lyft for, from Edinburgh, Halite, uh, TensorFlow, uh, TVM, and so on. So yeah, so this is what we, what we did. So um, we work on, on formal semantics and uh, domain expert optimizations. So we take, so this is kind of the mathematical expression. This is the, this is the source code. And this source code is embedded in Fortran, so they can just write this thing in their Fortran code instead of writing the, the, the for loops there themselves. Um, and this was also a very happy, happy result. Uh, what you see here is a plot on uh, gigaflops, performance kind of things. Um, and, and here you see libraries that people use, like um, DGMEM. This is for the Intel, uh, Intel MKL library. And you see the performance over here. Uh, interesting one is the blue one. This is the guy, this is the one that uh, a very good PhD student at the, at the, uh, at the lab, at the, at, the, at the group for computation free dynamics wrote uh, during his PhD time. And then you see in green and, and red, you see different, two different implementations that were automatically generated by the compiler. And then you see that most of the time it's better. And, and also you see that there are different trade-offs. Sometimes it's better to go green. Sometimes it's better to go red. So it's, it's, it's not an easy problem to solve. There are many things that we are doing there. 
But in principle, what we, what we did in the compiler was to encode this domain expert optimizations. It was not very fancy uh, optimization kind of things. It's just the matter of really capturing what is essential to convey information to the compiler so the compiler can do uh, the right decisions. And the right decisions, we got inspired by what we know that the that this expert programmer was doing. Right? So that's, that's very important. Um, so I, I mentioned this here because this is kind of uh, relevant in, the, in this domain of AI and machine learning. Most of these kernels are written with tensors. This is a plot from, from TVM, from uh, University of Washington. Um, but there's also tensor comprehension from Facebook, TensorFlow from Google. So you have different frameworks that are working with tensors. Um, and so what we, what, we, what we have been working on is uh, on having this like formalized transformation that you can do on tensors. Uh, formal semantics for safety checks, right? So like, um, and I'm going to talk about this. And optimizing for emerging memories, and I'm just going to give you a quick uh, overview of the results there. Um, yeah, so, and, and these things are also mixed up with, with these data flow things, right? People say that TensorFlow is a, is a data flow, is a data flow graph, so you have kind of a data flow at the higher level, and then on the nodes, you have these tensor expressions that you want to optimize. So it's kind of um, interlinked, if you wish, with, with the things before, but it not need to be like that. OK, so let's talk a little bit about, about uh, semantics. So the, the good thing about dom domain-specific languages and tailor these things to a particular domain is that you can do things uh, that we gave up doing for languages like C, right? So formal semantics kind of check how things should work. Um, so you can do kind of correct by design and, and have no abstraction leaks. Yes? The machine learning stuff? Before, no, yeah, I understood there was nothing from machine learning, but before these particular languages uh, came out, I think it was for tensors. So when we were working on tensors, when we started working on tensors, TensorFlow was kind of happening. We were working with. Fast yeah, so it was kind of more or less at the same time. So we, uh, so we worked with this with Albert Cohen that you may know. Yes. Um, so Albert Cohen is now with Google. And actually, for, for us, it was not, we didn't know that TensorFlow was going to be a thing. We, we knew that it was happening, but we, it was not a public domain or anything. So I think when we published the first thing, uh, it, it became public domain, or we, we were. Uh, that's that's uh, that's an excellent question, and, and we, we we tried we tried going that way. Um, so yeah, so let me let me talk a little bit about this, and because this is kind of this is kind of related, because what we did after those frameworks were out there, is that we we looked at those frameworks, and this is code from TVM. This is how you express a tensor uh, operation in TVM, which is from uh, University of Washington. It has a lot of traction, a lot of developers. And TensorFlow is similar. And so we looked, OK, let's, let's see if we can map these things into our intermediate language. Um, and actually, you, you see here that it is possible in these languages to uh, write wrong code. And that's what I mean with uh, abstraction leaks. Right? So for example, if you, if, you, if you provide a language for SDF, you shouldn't allow people to write kind of a KPM functionality. Uh, and what is happening in this code is that you're trying to write uh, this kind of operation here. Uh, so it's, they kind of messed up the dimension. They forgot to transpose B, right? So this code may actually run and may actually produce some results, but it's garbage. Or in the worst case, you get a segmentation fault. And that's why I, I, I mean with abstraction leaks, that if you, if you introduce an abstraction, it's like writing C code and, and getting an error message from the assembler. Uh, you, it's, it's hard, right? So uh, you, you don't want to have that. So uh, we work a little bit on the, on the semantics of a, of a core language, and we call that um, the uh, tensor intermediate language. So this is a, a core language that is formally proven to, to be semantic preserving and, and these kind of things um, that could be used as an intermediate language for these frameworks. And that's something that we are kind of working on uh, right now. Right? So that's, that's kind of the motivation that we showed in this, in this paper. If you, if you manage to narrow everything to these core constructs for tensors, you could lower from these different languages and profit from correct by construction code, which is in the end what we are doing also with when you have a formal model of computation behind a, uh, behind a program model. OK. Um, emerging architectures. So um, 
Alberto kind of alluded a little bit about this. So this is uh, a stack things, or, or in this case, uh, this tensor units. I'm not going to talk about how to optimize code for, for tensor accelerators. So there's, there is an interesting, there's an interesting paper in this year's CGO by, by Kim. Um, uh, the thing is that we, we will, or we expect to have these different accelerators, different kinds of technologies, integrated things. And one thing that I'm particularly interested in is uh, emerging memories, because especially for tensors, memories will play a, a big role. Um, so we've been working on hybrid uh, SCT uh, re-RAM uh, memories alongside with DRAM. Uh, but something that, I, something that I like a lot is this racetrack memories. And racetrack memories are kind of going in this vertical dimension, where you, instead of, ins ins instead of uh, storing a bit per access transistor, uh, which the access transistor would be this one over here, instead of storing one bit, uh, you, s you, you put a nanowire and uh, you store multiple bits per access transistor. Okay, so that's that, uh, and you could store up to 500 bits, for example, right? And these memories, so these are magnetic effects, and these memories are pretty quick. Um, and the nice things about these memories then that you can have kind of uh, 500 times the capacity uh, in more than the same area. Okay, that's kind of the, 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 the nice thing of these memories. And the nice thing of these memories from the point of view of compilers is that uh, this sequentiality of how the bits are stored are kind of a game changer for optimization. So it's not, on, not, only, not anymore only about locality, that all of these things that we do with tensors have to do with locality and use of caches and so on. Uh, it's also about sequentiality. How do you access your data? And how do you transform your code so that the access is, is, uh, kind of goes into the direction of how the bits were stored? And so that's, I, I thought that was very interesting. And then we, we had these tensor languages where we know uh, so the compiler knows a lot about the patterns that those operator, operators mean, so the, like tensor contraction, uh, tensor products. So we know what are the patterns of uh, memory accesses. We don't have to analyze them. We thought, can we, can we optimize those, those operators so that they run when data is stored in this kind of memories? And so we put a simulated, simulated system, so these things are not in production now. This is simulated systems. We collaborated with people doing the physics for these memories. Uh, and we say, okay, let's assume we have uh, embedded systems, uh, low, low power and whatnot. Non-volatile is good for low power. Uh, we have this kind of memory arrangement as it typically is, right? So in, in subarrays, in mats, in, in, in banks, and so on. Um, and uh, we kind of exploit, uh, or we kind of play with the, with the, f with, with the way you, you walk a tensor when you're doing multiplications. Um, Without going into details, it's, it's, at the end it's quite easy, right? So you kind of change the code so that you don't go this way and this way and then this way again and that way again, but you kind of zigzag so that you, can, so you don't have to shift so much. So you go this way and this way, and then you go this way and this way. It's kind of simple, but we are trying to generalize that for other operators, for other uh, kind of loop programs, um, and that's kind of at least to me, I wanted to share this with, with this group because I think that's, that's kind of fascinating to try to think how um, new technologies change the ways we generate code or change the way we, we think about systems. Okay? Um, so it worked. This is a recent publication, LCTES. So, um, if, so here we're comparing with ISO capacity SRAM. So it's, it's a hard comparison. And uh, we use very hard parameters for the racetrack memory. So it's, it's not very optimistic. So if you see that if you go from SRAM to RTM and you do nothing from the compiler perspective, or uh, also no prefetching, no pre-shifting, we're doing pre-shifting and other optimizations, you actually, in terms of latency, you're not doing so well, right? But once you start uh, doing this optimization that we propose in this paper, you go below uh, by 24% in average uh, latency, which is cool because you have this sequential thing that is happening there, but uh, you kind of amortize that by changing the code organization. And then as, as expected in, in terms of energy, uh, way better, right? Because it's a non-volatile memory technology, so kind of 74 74% improvement, and it comes um, a lot also because of leakage energy, which is uh, almost not not there only on the on the access transistors. Okay, so that's um, abstractions that allows us also to do a better job when we do uh, when 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 new technologies come into into the game. Um, good. So let me summarize the talk. So what we what we what I've been talking about is just this principle methodologies for programming are also a must. And I think that the, 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 the programming community can learn a lot from the EDA community, right? It's EDA, there's a lot of automation there. There's a lot of things that are happening. And you could do a lot of things in, for the software as well. 
Um, so yeah, preaching to the choir probably here because you know that these things are important. Uh, I very quickly go through these advances in auto parallelization, which I think is cool. So this, uh, I like the polyhedral compilers for the record. Yeah. Um, um, explicit parallel mock based program models, I think those are cool and, and I think several people here would agree. Um, some of what we're trying to do to increase adaptivity and, and uh, retain some predictability in systems which are more dynamic because there's not anymore the, the, the coffee machine system, right? It's something that is more dynamic in nature. So how, how can we still retain those nice properties in a system that is more dynamic? Um, and I talk about high level, level of sections like, and, and give tensors as, as an example because it's a high topic, but we are interested in, in general in this kind of things. Like how, how can you encode the things in a, in a syntax and in a semantic that gives the compiler a bit more information to do cooler stuff? Uh, and I think that's, a, that's an area, or at least that's an area that I'm excited to work in. Um, many challenges remain, thankfully, because only, uh, only five years into my professorship, so it should be cool stuff to do. Uh, cost models, characterization of trade-offs, instead of blind searches, I'm, I'm tired a bit of, of this blind search in the space, I think, um, kind of trying to build models so that you can, so, so you know better what you're doing. Uh, it would be cool, I know it's difficult, but it would be cool. Um, Understand this impact of emerging technologies, as I mentioned before. Um, semantics for correctness, as, as I said, this, this, the fact that you can bring domain-specific languages has a, as a, as a, uh, one of the good things that you can reuse all the tools that from, from theory of programming languages for, for doing stuff, right? So we did this thing with using the cock proof assistant uh, in semantics, and it was pretty easy because the, semantic is, so the semantics of the language is quite small, so you can, you can publish it in a paper, right? Uh, you cannot do that with, with Java or C. Um, and then, as I said, time semantics for things like adaptive autos are and these kind of systems, which are very important in CPS, so that you avoid having some problems due to timing effects. I think that's uh, also something quite important. So let me thank uh, people in my team. Uh, that's an acknowledgement to them doing most of the work. And with that, I'd like to close and thank you for your attention. So, 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 so the, the first one is um, whether we, we, we take into account the cost of changing. Uh, and I guess what you're allu alluding to is that uh, sometimes uh, if, if I'm running this configuration, and this configuration is the best one, but it's too far away, I'll probably be better off if I take this configuration, which is easier to change to faster, right? So we are not doing that. We are always switching to the, to the best one that we find. Um, because I th if we were happy with the time in the order of milliseconds, but that's an interesting problem. And I, th I think uh, these AdaptNet uh, people in Zurich, they did that so that they also know like, what is the cost from switching. It's kind of a matrix of costs so that you switch to a, a good one that is close so you don't have to spend too much time switching. That's, that's a good question. Um, the second one was about. Uh, Oh, yeah, if it's going to be rejected or not. Yeah, so we are, uh, so, so actually, so the, the system that we built there is called this Tetris runtime. Uh, we're still working on that. And right now, there is an, an admission test, but there is also kind of a reshuffling kind of thing. It's not only just playing Tetris and put it on top, but it's also kind of seeing if you can reshuffle a bit to make space. So, yeah, this is it's more complex than just playing Tetris. Or, uh, and there is also rejection if, 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 if it doesn't fit. Yeah. So, so the, the, the dummy example with the one plus two uh, is uh, something that we wrote on top of that. It's, uh, the, uh, the the graph that I showed there, that's like the so the the Autosar standard comes with um, like a test suite, and that's the largest application that they have. So it's it's it's, it's code, right? It's, it's it's the entire code, and it's provided by the consortium. Uh, so we had to become members of the consortium to get access to all the stuff. 
So, uh, so that that benchmark was in the consortium, in the in the repository. I don't think it is openly available now, but I guess it will be, and I guess if you ask, they will give you access to it. So I think it's at least our. Uh, it's been cool to cooperate with this. Uh, it's uh, yes, it is. It's C plus plus. So this 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 AutoSAR thing is is built. Um, is it built on top of a POSIX compliant OS, and it's uh, all like built with uh, C++ uh, threads and stuff. The 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 graph. The No, not so much. Not so much. There's a global state. There's stuff that was difficult to factor out. Yeah, but but the, it, it is a service-oriented architecture, so. So there's this kind of service that's discovery. You have channels, so you have ports, but everybody can write into that. So it's, 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 it's more flexible than data flow in a sense, right? Because everybody can send th things to your port. Um, I have three questions, but they are kind of spread, so let's go one by one. Yep. The first one is uh, you, you had a graph about comparing the different uh, model of computations and uh, yes. the uh, anal analyzability and, and so on. Yes. Um, is that a matter of, this comparison is kind of a matter of fact, I mean you really can say that and it will remain for that or is it dependent on the techniques we know nowadays about how to analyze them or, or hmm. uh, the, the same thing about the implementation efficiency, I mean can, can it change that KPNs for example becomes a bit more analyzable by, by inventing new techniques or Yeah, or yeah. so I think um, so in, in terms of Analyzability of the things that you can do, I think that that's kind of a, a, a fact, right? So with SDF you can do this, with KPNs you cannot do that, right? In KPNs it's undecidable whether the thing will terminate or not. Right? So th th it's just a matter of, of the model, right? Um, so, th there are, so there are some hard properties that I think are built in, in, into the model. Right? If it is deterministic or not, that's just a fact of the model. Um, about the implementation efficiency, and I think other like the exact uh, the exact lattice here. I don't know if it is really a total order. If it is so, yeah. So I think that you can argue about some of the positioning there about implementation efficiency. I think that there's still things that you can do better, right? So it's, uh, um, as I said, with, with analysis, you cannot. So in general, from the model the KPN, you cannot do this and this and that. But it's, but there are some simple analysis where you could. Oh yeah, this is this, this is that, this is that. So you could implement things more efficiently. Uh, with efficiently means you can actually, some case, in some case you can merge processes, right? Uh, so in, in general, m it is impossible to merge two KPM processes because they are Turing complete machines. So you don't know if you merge them, by merging them, you have to find a schedule. So it's impossible. But it's not always impossible, right? So. Yeah, the second question was about uh, uh, when you talk about the rotations. Yes. Um, what do you really mean by, by rotation? Uh, uh, it, it seems to me like uh, you are finding new mappings, uh, yeah. but, but the, I, in, at least uh, ge geometrically, if you talk about rotation, you have one of the dimensions is an invariant, or, or, or yeah. uh, uh, and do you have some kind of definition of things that, that are invariant? Yes, exactly. Okay. So, so they are invariants. And so you see that there are rotations, there are translations, there are kind of things. Um, so um, you can, you are invited to check the paper. The, so that's a taco one. Yeah. Uh, the, so simple symmetries in mathematics are like, uh, are studied with group theory, right? So, and, and that's kind of a global rotations, kind of global, like you could think of just geometrically moving the, which is not, it doesn't give you a lot of flexibility. Uh, so what we did then was inverse semi-groups, which is kind of an specialized version where you kind of, you, you can do rotations within subsets of the platform, so that you have more, you, you can have more solutions, so to speak. Yeah, so that's so you are not you are changing the mapping, but as I said, retaining the properties. Of, yeah. uh, and the third question is a more general one. Uh, I, I I operate with the same type of questions, but on a more system level, really integrating okay. mm -hmm. uh, beyond the chips. Mm -hmm. uh, what is your feeling about uh, is is it feasible to apply these ideas to to big systems or or these constraints of uh, the, yeah, the, the the limitations of uh, applying data flow are too harsh for for for, mm -hmm. for using in a, in a big um, system level? Yeah. So 
I, I would say it is possible. Yeah, I think I, I think it is possible. I think we we've um, I didn't show this here, but what, another DSL that we have been developing is a like a functional language with which you can describe um, kind of big data processing stuff, pipelines. And that is, uh, is functional because it's easier to write than when you use rates and, and stuff. So it's, it's a functional thing that looks like sequential, but in the end we create a, So the compiler internally creates a data flow again, and we have used that for uh, accelerating things in Hadoop MapReduce and so larger systems. Um, the, the thing is that I was discussing with you in, in, during breakfast, right? I think in, in the embedded domain, it, when you are within a SOC, things happen in a very fine-grained scale, and you have to exploit that, right? So you, you have this, and, and, and you have to know the access to memory. So there's a lot of clockwork, kind, kind of almost at the clock level, right? When you are in a larger system, you have more slack because you are communicating anyway. You, have, you are serializing, deserializing objects. There is a lot of overheads in the systems that are there for language interoper interoperability or for uh, failure, right? So MapReduce has a lot of things for failure, um, dealing with machines that are going down and up. So there's a lot of things that makes like the, the we, here we put in a lot of effort to make it like clockwork kind of thing. Uh, in a large system, you, you, there are some other problems that or go beyond your control. Or Rephrasing the question, do, do you believe that in the future it would be a compiler that would compile things for this level of... of oh, of in, if, you, if you put it like that, yes, absolutely. <laughs> um, but I, I was just talking about uh, the data flow, in the, but the, the tensor stuff that's running on a cluster. Right, so we're generating things for clusters. We can generate things for, for G GPUs, right? So, uh, so yeah, definitely. And, and the... Uh, the, the TensorFlow stuff runs in huge uh, machines, right? So. Okay, uh, sorry to interrupt this uh, nice discussions. Uh, if you have other questions, Helen is going to be around for short today. Yeah. Uh, tomorrow, to tomorrow at dinner. Yeah. Tomorrow at dinner. Uh, so let's again, thanks again, our speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, so unexpected. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Very nice.